the 200,000 years humans have lived on this planet, we've lived within the Earth's capacity to regenerate itself. That is until 1970. In the last 45 years, we've gone from using one planet's worth of resources and its ability to absorb our wastes to using one and a half planets. And we're well on path now to three planets by 2050 if we don't change course. The current economic system we've got has undoubtedly brought a lot of prosperity to a lot of people, but it's past its sell-by date now. It's now causing us real problems. As the population has grown and as that model has been taken up by countries all over the world, the impact on the planet's ecological systems have become more and more significant. I think we need a different set of glasses to look at economies. You know, we've got to change direction and do it really quickly because actually we're on the edge of some really nasty things. The linear economy is a dead-end road. We have not inherited another planet here from our parents. Now we are borrowing it from our children. We all want to live a good uh, life to, to the next generation. It is our responsibility to make sure now that uh, we leave a planet behind us now which is better than it has been before. The idea of, of a true north version of capitalism, a version of capitalism that provides the economic development, the prosperity, the positive growth that we want, but does that in a way that is socially just, does that in a way that is environmentally sustainable, uh, is the key challenge that we face, I think, as a generation, not just of business leaders, of governments, citizens around the world. Globally, we're heading south. If you look at almost any major indicator of environmental social governance metrics, if you look at the quality of our oceans, if you look at carbon emissions, if you look at biodiversity, if you look at growing inequality around the world and the ongoing challenges of poverty, we know that we haven't got the compass. We're not following the right direction to get to where we want to. To some extent, sustainability and sustainable business has often worshipped false gods. Right? So we've actually been happy with making incremental progress. It's not to say that there isn't important benefits from incremental progress. Small shifts in energy efficiency, corporate responsibility policies on the edge of business. It's not to say there's anything wrong with that in and of itself, but it's not the true north we're talking about. True north is about actually reorienting the entire system so that it rewards and incentivizes business that at the core of their strategies, at the core of their business models, their global supply chains, that they're embedding the principles of fairer growth, of more sustainable growth, of responsible growth, and doing well and doing good. So where we live now in a world where we just take, make and waste the products and the resources that we use, we need to move to an economy where we reduce, reuse and recycle the resources, where we decouple the resources from economic growth and to ensure that there is a closed loop economic model. Think of the circular economy as an aspirational thing where we aspire to productive and resource efficient cycling of materials in systems devised by humans in the same way that resources are cycled in natural systems. The emergence of the so-called circular economy in a sense is nothing new um, because actually people have been exploring how to use resources and materials more efficiently you know, for, from the beginning of time. The logic is that if we, start, if we stop digging up as much resource out of the ground, we, we will be able to restore some of the ecology. And instead of digging it up out of the ground, we could effectively mine stuff that we've already put into cities and into industrialised economies, actually mine some of that material and reuse it for, for, for a different purpose. And, and we call that the circular economy. We are facing a lot of issues as a world. You know, we have a growing population, we have a growing middle class, we have dwindling resources. We cannot continue to consume in the way we have done in the past. Yet we're all aspiring to lifestyles that mean we want 
um, lots of products and services. So the question is, can the circular economy help us to make better use of resources to allow us to have the lifestyles we want? I guess the best way of describing the circular economy is to contrast it with the linear economy, which is what we have today. And the linear economy is pretty simple. We dig things up, we use them for a bit, and then we shove them back in a hole in the ground. And if you imagine yourself as an alien sort of looking down on the planet, you sort of see this activity and you think it was pretty crazy. And the circular economy is really just a way of plugging all of that material back into the economy, keeping it in use for longer. And what's really interesting is seeing how companies are making opportunities out of the reuse and remanufacturing side of things, or the repair side of things, as opposed to the recycling. We spent 18 months researching, both desk research, but also getting out there and speaking to more than 120 companies around the world, across sectors, large companies, smaller companies. And what we found is that those companies are already using the principles of circular economy, the principles of lower resource use, but using it to enhance products and services to create competitive advantage. Sustainable business, companies that are proactively approaching sustainability and resource scarcity, we already see in research that the financial performance of these companies is better. It can range from 30 to 40 percent even. What we found in our research is that to 2030 there's a four and a half trillion dollar global opportunity for companies that get this right to tap into. And if we look at the leaders already, a hundred plus companies already creating competitive advantage. Large businesses, multinationals, but also smaller disruptive players using things like digital technology. The Apple example is really interesting because they, they're essentially a vertically integrated company. They sell the product, they design the product, and they create the software for the product. And because they control all three components of that, they can take the product back, refurbish it, put new software on it, and sell it again as new. Caterpillar now has a billion dollar business employing 4,000 people that actually remanufactures and reconditions the 6,000 parts that sit at the heart of Caterpillar's industrial equipment. It has the highest margin within Caterpillar. It hasn't cannibalized their business as some had feared. And actually it's something that is helping them to create new opportunities in new markets at new price points by remanufacturing. Why is that circular? Caterpillar is able in every remanufactured component to be 90% more energy efficient and 80% more re, uh, uh, resource efficient across the board, materials, metals, plastics, than if they used virgin materials and they started from scratch. Michelin, the global tyre manufacturer, is now shifting from selling tyres as a product to tyres as a service. How? It's embedding technology sensors within its wheels so it can sell the tyre to, for example, an airline or, for example, to a fleet customer per kilometre travelled. Rather than selling the tyre, I'm selling you the use of the tyre. I take that tyre back at the end of life cycle. It changes the whole dynamic and the economics, but it also changes the design mentality. Suddenly, I don't want you to buy a new tyre every two or three years. I want that tyre to last as long as it possibly can. The winners of tomorrow in my opinion, are the ones that are working on a zero waste concept, but also really reducing impact. Well, it's a different concept of design also, how we design our products, how we offer the products. We can offer products as a service, keeping them uh, in ownership to ensure that um, we can also recycle and reuse them. And then the design process is really important that we design upfront, not to ensure that as many as possible products are sold, but that products last as long as possible. A lot of our work has been around behavior change and thinking about how you actually design for a sustainable planet. What we're now seeing and what's interesting about the way that design is shifting is that kind of like we're moving away from a product-based focus for designers into something which is much more about the system. So circularity is a really great example of where you actually really do need to redesign a whole system of thinking. So, you know, you can have the best sustainable product in the world, but actually if you haven't got a logistical system set up where you can pick that product up, you know exactly where it's going, if it's going off to be recovered as a material, 
whether it's going back to the manufacturers for to be remanufactured into a new material or a new product. If you don't have that system, it gets lost and you lose all the value. Complexity is the crux, really, of circular economy. Things like plastics, you know, we have like so many different types of plastics going through our recovery facilities at the moment. And they come in and, you know, you could think a, a PET drinks bottle, you know, like a plastic drinks bottle is just one type of plastic. No, it's at least four types of plastic in there, especially if it's got a shrink wrap around it, it's got all these different inks, etc. So what they're seeing is this massive confusion and huge amount of just mix, nothing is the same. And that's one of the biggest problems with our stuff. Nothing is the same. Complexity, oh my God, that if, if we could like deal with that, we'd be like well on our way for circularity. One of the problems with uh, circularity for businesses is they see that their profit sits on their unit of product. So the more units they sell, you know, the more that they, the more profit they make. Now, if you say, well, you're gonna build something for longevity or leasing, they immediately lose that profit. The fact that we're now focusing the whole design process away from the unit cost of something into a holistic approach about how you can recover the value back in the material, because we have to remember that the, um, the product is only one small blip in the life of that material. I think change is always an opportunity and this is a change that is happening, it's going to happen, it's inevitable. Um, companies do need to prepare themselves and the opportunity to, is to be on the leading edge rather than waiting to see what's happening and left behind. There's a significant uh, business potential in the circular economy. That was one of the key findings also of our report. But also it involves a lot of challenges. Challenges when it comes to growth of the market. There is not yet a mature market for the circular economy and it needs to be boosted. But also the um, rethinking of existing models. So new business models, but also new financial models. There are definitely opportunities for um, banks in supporting a supply chain to work together to create an ecosystem by financing um, the supply chain. Uh, currently, products are just being uh, valued on the basis of a purchase. But if you have more strategic partnerships in place in a supply chain, and as a bank, you can also finance different parts or sometimes also at the same time within a supply chain, you can stimulate and accelerate um, this uh, collaboration process in the supply chain much more. And I think there is also a key role which we can play together with a number of um, companies in this whole supply chain to sit together and say, what are the different challenges? How can we overcome these? How can we also design contracts, financing contracts um, that stimulate and accelerate this collaboration in the supply chain? Well, businesses can still make lots of money. If we look at between now and 2030, which is when the sustainable development goals apply, um, in those 15 years, as cities change and evolve globally, there's probably going to be about 50 to 70 trillion dollars spent in the world in, in, in making that progress happen. So what we're talking about is changing the way that 50 to 70 trillion dollars is invested globally, you know, to try to help people to invest it in, in a more resilient, sustainable way. So it, for the private sector, if that means their investments are, are risk assessed and therefore um, are therefore going to be less risky for them, that's obviously a good thing for them in terms of their long-term business. And in terms of getting a return on capital, if you're investing in renewable energy or green technology or businesses that use assets more efficiently, um, or in buildings that actually are power stations instead of being you know, users of energy, which is now possible, then of course you're going to be successful. So actually it's a matter of businesses understanding what the world needs and providing business models that deliver those needs. And if people do that, then they can make lots of money out of it. We need to manage that process. This will not be a panacea unmanaged.
This is a circular economy. This is a whole new economic model. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be, a, it's going to be painful. We need to make sure that businesses are aligned and incentivised. Governments have the right policies and regulatory support uh, and the right investments and innovation. Uh, and that across the board we have an alignment that this is what we're trying to achieve uh, at a global level. And each of us have a different role at different levels. I'm not sure I'm a great fan of, of false incentives. I want things to, I want the market to work properly on its own. So um, how do we make the market work? And then, so therefore, what are the barriers and how do you remove those barriers? But it's going to be far more sustainable as a solution if we can make it work on its own without needing false incentives. So I think it, that, that should be our ideal, is to try to develop a way of making it sustainable without those incentives. You do have to have really strong leadership um, whether it's in government, whether it's in manufacturing, whether it's in business, corporations, etc. You also need to have conveners. So this is the role of EMF, this is the role of us, you know, other organisations in this space, RAP. They're the ones that are kind of pulling people together, saying have this conversation, the brokering of the network, which is really, really key. You just have to start somewhere and try. Map out your own ecosystem, map out your own value chains, map out the players that are within them, and actually you find very quickly you can make connections using this principle. The circular economy is a radical new way of thinking about driving competitive advantage for businesses. This is a concept that is pro-business, this is pro-growth, but it's about driving a different kind of growth. A growth that innovates for customers, but does it in a way that eliminates or reduces wasted materials, harmful materials. It's based on the idea of utilising assets more effectively, of closing loops, of extending product life cycles, but not cannibalising businesses, but actually creating new ways to create value and new ways to delight the customer. Business leaders can make contributions, in my view, not through philanthropy, not through corporate community affairs or citizenship, but by embedding the principles of sustainability at the very heart of their businesses, developing and innovating the next generation of products and services, rethinking their business models, rethinking their supply chains to embed that true north vision at the heart of the way they do business, not as a bolt-on, not as an afterthought, but at the heart of the way do they do business.